Okay, today we're going to talk about cervical fascia and answer the what questions. What is fascia? What are the superficial and deep fascial planes in the neck? What's contained in each of these uh, planes? And what are retropharyngeal and danger spaces? Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Morton, and I'm the noted anatomist. So first of all, fascia is Latin for a band or bandage because fascia forms strands or sheets of fibrous or collagenous connective tissue that wrap around the anatomy of the body to form compartments. So in today, we're going to talk about sheets of connective tissue that form compartments in the neck. Okay. So the cervical fascia picture we're going to use is going to be this following orientation. We're going to take cross section around the C6 level, separate out, look from foot to head, and there's the section we're going to look at like this, where the top of the picture is anterior, the bottom is posterior. Okay. Anatomically, cervical fascia is important because it forms concentric layers of cervical fascia that compartmentalize the neck anatomy, like muscular, vascular, and visceral compartments. Clinically, it's important because of the surgical orientation it provides and the understanding of spread of diseases like cancer and infection, and especially relevant in ear, nose, and throat surgery and radiology. And so here's the picture, and shing, there are the fascial planes within that we're going to talk about that compartmentalize concentrically. And there are the different fascial planes and the anatomy contained therein. We're going to talk about superficial fascia, then deep fascia and the subdivisions. So first, superficial fascia is this blinking part there, which is the subcutaneous tissue all around the circumference of the neck and continuous all throughout the body. It's basically your hypodermis. And it contains in the neck a muscle called the platysma muscle, which arises from the corner of the mouth and goes all the way down in the neck and then fuses and into uh, the uh, fascia around the clavicle and pectoralis major muscle. Okay, and that's the platysma, the only muscle in the superficial fascia. It also has cutaneous veins, arteries, and nerves, branches from the uh, cervical plexus. The deep fascia is this, everything in that blinking area where there are compartments for muscles and vessels and viscera, and it's easier for these structures and compartments to slide over each other. So the different uh, subdivisions of the deep fascia are as follows. We're going to start with the deep investing fascia first. The deep investing fascia is that blinking structure there, and it's deep to the superficial fascia, and it arises and circles around the entire neck. It arises from the nuchal ligament, and then it's going to en envelop the trapezius muscle and the sternocleidomastoid, and then wrap around to the other side of the neck. So the deep investing fascia envelops the sternocleidomastoids and traps on both sides, and it looks like the four corners of the neck. The deep investing fascia forms the roof of the posterior triangle. What's the posterior triangle? Well, it's the space between the sternocleidomastoid and traps. It's best seen on a lateral view. There's the sternocleidomastoid and there's the trapezius, shing, and it's the space in between and there's the posterior triangle. That looks like a triangle and the space in between is the deep investing fascia, the roof of the posterior triangle. Um, the, the deep investing fascia is pierced by cutaneous branches off the cervical plexus and external jugular vein. Look at that cross section. There you see coming out that cervical plexus and then it pierces through the fascia right behind the sternocleidomastoid into the superficial fascia. So there, it's called the herbs point of the neck, right on the back of the sternocleidomastoid, all of those cutaneous branches from the cervical plexus go out to the neck. And then there at the very bottom is the external jugular vein, the bottom of that posterior triangle, and that external jugular vein pierces that deep investing fascia. Um, the boundaries. Well, the boundaries of the deep investing fascia are the mandible and hyoid and sternum on the front, the clavicle and scapula on the side, and the occipital bone, nuchal ligament, and trapezius along the back. The next is the pretracheal fascia, which is that blinking one there. And the pretracheal fascia forms the visceral compartment. What are the viscera? Well, the thyroid gland and the trachea and the recurrent laryngeal nerves on either side and the esophagus in this section, but the pharynx up higher. And then there are the parathyroid glands um, as well that are not shown, but are in that area. Um, the prefacial fascia has a specific name to the back. The posterior border is called the buccal pharyngeal fascia, which is all along there in that tan color because that fascia envelops the buccinator and the pharyngeal constrictor muscles. Um, the boundaries for the pretracheal fascia are as follows. It's going to see there is our pretracheal fascia along the front. It's the hyoid and uh, thyroid laryngeal cartilages, and it envelops the thyroid gland and fuses into the pericardial sac. Posteriorly, there's the buccal pharyngeal fascia. It courses from the skull all the way down into the mediastinum.
Between the pretracheal and buccal pharyngeal fascia is the trachea, and then the pharynx up high and the esophagus down below. Okay. Now the prevertebral fascia is next, and it's that blinking fascia. And it forms the muscular compartment, which includes the vertebral column. And there it is there. It includes the longest coli here, longest capitus up higher, anterior, middle, and posterior scalene muscles, levator scapulae, and the paraspinals. Now, the sympathetic trunk, anatomists usually don't include it in there, but often radiologists will include it part of the prevertebral fascia. Um, I've cloned it outside because I'm an anatomist. The phrenic nerve is in front of the scalene and the cervical and brachial plexuses both course from between the anterior and middle scalenes. All this within the prevertebral fascia. Um, the prevertebral fascia forms the axillary sheath. And so what happens when we take a look at that brachial plexus is that as it exits, it pulls that uh, the fascia from the prevertebral fascia with it, and it makes a sleeve along with it that we call the axillary sheath, which is enveloping the brachial plexus as well as the subclavian and uh, axillary artery. It also forms, the prevertebral fascia forms the floor of the posterior triangle. There's the posterior triangle, and there's a lateral view of the posterior triangle, and it forms the floor because watch, when you cut through, shing, Right on the floor of the posterior triangle is prevertebral fascia. There's the cut edge. We go down, there's that prevertebral fascia. I'm sorry, you can hear like our kids using uh, Alexa down here calling to each other from around the house. <laughs> and so the prevertebral fascia also has something called the alar fascia. It's an anterior subdivision of the prevertebral fascia. Let's watch. As the prevertebral fascia approaches that transverse process, shing, it separates and forms this anterior lamina called the Alar fascia. Basically, the prevertebral fascia along the front has two layers. So in sagittal section and the cross section, we can see prevertebral alar fascia, prevertebral alar fascia in that section. Okay. And the alar fascia fuses with the buccal pharyngeal fascia somewhere around the T1 to T4 vertebral level. Prevertebral fascia, alar fascia, buccal pharyngeal fascia. Now follow the alar and buccal pharyngeal fascia. They fuse around the T1 vertebra in my illustration here. Now the carotid sheath is that blinking structure and it is formed by the adjacent fascial sleeves like the deep investing fascia by the sternocleidomastoid, the prevertebral fascia by the anterior scalene, and the pretracheal fascia on the edge of the thyroid. All of those segments all then condense around and form this vascular compartment called the carotid sheath. And this vascular compartment contains the internal jugular vein, the carotid arteries, and the vagus nerve like that. Now what's not seen here are the deep cervical nodes and the carotid sinus nerves. Now let's do that uh, carotid sheath again except from this anterior view where there's the internal jugular vein, there's our carotid arteries, and you see that vagus nerve coming up, but it hugs deep inside and to the uh, two vessels there. And so we blow that up and come over here. And so there's our internal jugular vein, lateral, and then the carotid arteries, medial, and the vagus nerve is snug as a bug as a rug in between them, okay? Um, now the carotid sheath also has what's called the ansa cervicalis within the wall. We blow that up and we see something called the cervical plexus and there's C1 to C5 ventral rami and then coming from C1 to C2 and 3 is this loop called the ansa cervicalis and if we take a cross section right through there, that inferior limb is formed is shown there in the cross section and the superior limb is shown there in the cross section. So when you dissect in a cadaver, this ansa cervicalis is found within the sheath of the carotid sheath in the neck. Now the infrahyoid muscles are shown here and the fascia around the infrahyoid muscles is kind of interesting in anatomy because where does it belong in the deep cervical fascia? Well, it depends on the reference that you use. And so the Gray's Anatomy Net reference and most clinicians will say that the fascia around the infrahyoid muscles is around is a subset of the pretracheal fascia. So there's a pretracheal fascia and the fascia on the infrahyoids is just a subdivision of that. And that's the one that I subscribe to. But some anatomists and surgeons will say, well, actually the fascia around the infrahyoid muscles is a subset of the deep investing fascia. So we're gonna take the infrahyoid muscle fascia and put it with the deep investing fascia. And then some clinicians will say, ah, it's, only its, own, it's its own fascial compartment. We'll call it the middle layer of deep cervical fascia.
Now let's talk about anatomical spaces in the deep cervical fascia. Okay, so anatomical spaces where the fascial layers in the neck define some potential spaces. And so in healthy patients, these spaces are actually closed. But infections can widen these spaces and then serve as conduits for the spread. Bacteria like streptococci produce proteolytic enzymes which digest this connective tissue, furthering enable these infections to spread. So the retropharyngeal and the danger spaces are the two primary ones we're going to talk about. Let's start with the retropharyngeal space. This is a space between the buccal pharyngeal fascia and the alar fascia right there. Next is the danger space, which is between the alar fascia and the prevertebral fascia right there. So there are two different potential spaces. That was fun. Let's do it again. So the retropharyngeal space in this cross section is between the buccal pharyngeal fascia and the alar fascia right there. And this is what permits movements of the pharynx, larynx, and esophagus during swallowing. So the retropharyngeal space is like bed sheets. So when we take a look at this bed, oh, that's a nice bed. That's not what my bed looks like. So there's the mattress sheet, and then there's another bed sheet. And the cozy space, oh, the cozy space is right in there, right between the bed sheet and the mattress sheet. So the space is there, but the only way to get in there is you push your feet into that cool, comfortable space, and that's what separates the two sheets because the space is not really there. It's potential, but it, you, you have to form it by pushing something in there. Well, the retropharyngeal space is like bed sheets. So here we have the buccal pharyngeal fascia, one bed sheet, the alar fascia, the other bed sheet, and then the cozy retropharyngeal space is right in there. But the only way to do it is you have to force your way into that and then do this, shing, and then force it open like that, which is how we see it in these pictures all the time. But those pictures are actually misleading because that's the way it looks all the time. Um, now, what causes the retropharyngeal space to extend, uh, expand? Well, that is where the abscesses and infections come into play, okay? And so abscesses and infections may bulge anteriorly, and then they can restrict swallowing and breathing. And the reason why is that the esophagus is directly in front of the retropharyngeal space. That would restrict swallowing because the pharynx is just above it. And then really bad would push on the trachea and the airways and restrict breathing. And, then, and so the retropharyngeal space can also have infections that spread into the mediastinum. So there's our prevertebral and alar fascias, and there's the buccal pharyngeal fascia. Now watch, alar and buccal pharyngeal fascias fuse around the T1 to T4 vertebral levels. And so when the retropharyngeal space, if there's an infection, can spread down. And right there, it's like short sheeting in a bed where they two fuse and the infection cannot spread past that. Now, the danger prevertebral space is between the prevertebral and alar fascias. And so right there is where the fascia is or in cross-section right in that area. And so infection can spread from the skull base all the way down into the posterior mediastinum. Um, so let's now do a review of both of these spaces. There's buccal pharyngeal and alar fascias. And what's between them? retropharyngeal space. There's the alar fascia and prevertebral fascia. What's between them? The danger spaces. So therefore, the alar fascia separates the retropharyngeal from the danger spaces. Cool. So anatomically, there are two distinct spaces, but in healthy patients, alar fascia is not visible. Why? Because it's also like a bed sheet. The alar fascia really is like this. It's collapsed. And so anatomists and clinicians will say that whole yellow space in there, that's the retropharyngeal space. So often when we define the retropharyngeal space, anatomists will say, well, the buccal pharyngeal fascia is between and the prevertebral fascia is where the retropharyngeal space is. Or they'll say retropharyngeal space is between buccal pharyngeal and alar fascias or buccal pharyngeal and prevertebral fascias. That's what makes it confusing in many references or professors that might be lecturing on this topic. And so what happens is you see that dark line? That's an infection spreading that goes and it pushes the alar fascia away from the prevertebral fascia and you form the danger space. And then the rest of the opening in front of it, that's the retropharyngeal space. And so you can say retropharyngeal space looks like that or like that. Either one. Thank you, anatomist. Thank you for making that so clear. So let's do a little review, shall we? So most clinicians are going to use the following categorization of the superficial and deep fascias of the neck. 
Now, a radiologist, on the other hand, will say, well, that's superficial fascia, and that's the jargon I'm going to use. And the deep fascia, I'm going to use my own jargon. Instead of calling this the deep investing fascia, I'm going to say that's the superficial layer of the deep and deep fascia. And instead of calling this the pretracheal fascia, I'm going to say that's the middle layer of the deep cervical fascia. And then I'll just call that the carotid sheath. And instead of calling this the prevertebral fascia, I'm going to call it the deep layer of the deep cervical fascia. And so what we see is there's discrepancy and there's problems in the cervical fascia terminology and description. And so there's this early surgeon named Joseph Francois Malagueigne who said the cervical fascia appear in a new form under the pen of each author who attempts to describe them. Yeah, so frustrating. I totally get it. And back in 18, early 1800s and right to today is the same thing. So radiologists use this jargon. Mostly everyone else uses this jargon. And that, my friends, is the cervical fascia in a nutshell.